Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Natus, where medicine makes perfect sense. This is video number 49 in my physiology playlist. In this playlist, from video number 1 through 25, we talked about introduction, the cell membrane, transport, diffusion, osmosis, etc. From 25 to 40, we talked about the autonomic nervous system physiology. From 40 to 50, this is nerve physiology. Today, it's time for the propagation of the action potential, which is a big lie, because the action potential technically does not propagate. Please watch these videos in order. Let's review my nuggets. Nugget number one, why do you need an action potential? Because action potential is everything. The nerve impulse is unidirectional. The nerve impulse starts at the axon hillock. During resting, the inside is negative and the outside is positive. But upon activation or depolarization, the inside becomes more positive compared to the outside. Local anesthetics affect the small fibers first, the C fibers. However, hypoxia affect the large fibers first, A fibers. Pressure or hypoxia, A, are affected first. Local anesthetics, C fibers, are affected first. Chronaxia is the time, because chrono is time. Time needed by a current whose intensity is double the rear base. During rest, it's called the resting potential. Upon stimulation, if you treat me with respect, I'll treat you with respect, called action potential. If you treat me with less respect, I'll treat you with no respect. During rest, potassium efflux. Upon depolarization, sodium influx. And then repolarization, you stop the sodium influx and you start potassium efflux. And then you overshoot, inward rectifying, return to normal. During rest, the inside is negative. Selective permeability, during rest, the membrane is more permeable to potassium compared to sodium. What are the causes of the resting membrane potential, the selective permeability and the AT pace pump? Nernest equation told us that the potassium efflux is way more important than the sodium influx during rest. The Goldman's equation told us that the selective permeability is more important than the sodium-potassium ATPase pump when it comes to the resting membrane potential. Sodium problems, CNS problems. Calium problems, cardiac problems. The rule of fours. Who's responsible for the polarized state? The potassium efflux. This is the resting state, depolarization, repolarization, hyperpolarization, resting again. Depolarization is sodium's job. Sodium is coming in. How about repolarization? You close the sodium channels and you open the potassium leading to potassium efflux. Too much potassium efflux, hyperpolarization. Get some of that potassium in by the inward rectifying and then you come back to normal. Pause and review. The refractory period was discussed before. Subthreshold will give you a local response or it will give you electronic potentials such as cat electrotonus and n electrotonus. The cations are the positive charges. Think of the positive charges as the good guys and the negative charges as the bad guys. So the cat electrotonus gets you closer to the firing level. What happens to excitability? It's increased. Yeah, good guys excite me, but bad guys, they bore me. Excitability is decreased and I'm moving away from the firing level. When you increase calcium at the ECF, you decrease nerve excitability. Anything that decreases nerve excitability is a membrane stabilizer. Now to today's topic. What's the difference between monophasic and biphasic? Okay, monophasic is when you put the two electrodes at one point, one on the inside surface and one on the outside surface of the nerve, but both of them are on the same point here. However, biphasic, two electrodes at two different points like that, and both are on the outer surface of the nerve. Which one do we use clinically? Only the monophasic. What's the problem with the biphasic? The biphasic, you have one electrode here and one electrode here. Okay, oh, all right. This one will stimulate the nerve. That's fine. And this one will stimulate the nerve. However, this first point has not finished yet, causing an electrical interference. That's why we no longer use the biphasic. If you remember, these are your individual nerve fibers. This entire structure is the nerve. So let's say that we're talking about the ulnar nerve. This is your ulnar nerve, okay? Inside your ulnar nerve, you see those bundles and every bundle has different separate nerve fibers. The action potential that we talked about was the action potential of each individual nerve fiber. But what about the action potential of the entire stinking ulnar nerve? This is the story of the compound action potential. It's the action potential in the nerve trunk. Why do you call it compound? Because it has many peaks on its descending limb. Why do we have many peaks on the descending limb? Easy, because you remember that ulnar nerve? Yeah, it has 
many, many, many individual nerve fibers. And each fiber has a different speed of conduction. Each fiber has its stimulation threshold and each fiber has a different side from the stimulating electrode. The distance between the nerve fiber and the electrode is different. Some nerves are closer to the electrodes, others are far away from the electrodes. The action potential of each individual nerve fiber is not graded because the action potential cannot be graded and cannot be summated. However, the compound action potential can be graded. Why? Because if I give subthreshold stimulus to the entire ulnar nerve, none of the fibers will have an action potential and will have no response in the entire ulnar nerve. But as you increase the intensity of the stimuli, not all of your nerve fibers are created equal, some of them will experience the action potential, other fibers will not, and you will see a small action potential in the entire ulnar nerve. As you increase the intensity of the stimulus, even more fibers will get stimulated, that's the action potential, and the amplitude will increase until you reach the maximal stimulation. But if you give me supramaximal, ah, I'm sorry, I've already plateaued. No more increase in the amplitude. So the ulnar nerve is graded, but each individual fiber in the ulnar nerve cannot be graded. Conduction or propagation of the action potential. Honestly, it does not propagate. Why not? Have you ever been to a party where they have lights? Yeah, if you look at the light, you will have the illusion that the light is moving. Oh, it's, it's not actually moving. This is lighting on, but this is turned off, off, off. And then you turn this off, but you turn the next one on. And then you turn this off and you turn the next one on, giving you the illusion. The false perception that the light is actually moving to the right, when it's actually not moving at all. It's just one is turning on, the next is turned off, etc. Same exact thing with the action potential. Let's say a stimulus came here to this area and this area experienced an action potential. All right, and then the next area is during rest. And then we will flip. This one will rest, this one will have an action potential. This one will rest, action potential, giving you the illusion that the action potential is propagating when in fact it's not. So how does the action potential propagate? Okay, in the unmyelinated fiber versus in the myelinated fiber. Same concept with slight tweaking. Let's go. This area experiences an action potential. During depolarization, the inside becomes more positive and the outside, therefore, is more negative relative to the inside. Awesome. The adjacent area is still resting, which means the inside is negative and the outside is positive. Everything is relative. Now, when you put a negative next to a positive, what's going to happen? Oh, opposites attract. The negative charges in the resting site will attract the positive charges from the active site. When the positive is attracted here, now the inside of the membrane is becoming more positive here, generating an action potential. This light was on, this light was off, and then this light turned off, this one turned on, and so on and so forth. This is the propagation. The speed of propagation is directly proportional to the diameter of the nerve fiber. That's the square root of the diameter. Mathematically speaking, if the speed of propagation is proportional to the square root of the diameter, it's going to be proportional to the diameter itself. The shape of the graph will be different, but the concept is the same. Both are directly proportional. Which kind of fiber has the biggest diameter? Oh, the largest diameter is A. That's why the speed of propagation is highest in A. See, applied mathematics makes perfect sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. As the action potential moves and conducts and propagates, will this increase the magnitude? Absolutely not. Let's talk about the myelinate fibers. The myelinate fibers have myelin sheath. Interrupted at the nodes of Ranvier. And that's why instead of moving and easing throughout the nerve, we will jump. Jump from this node to the next node to the next node to the next node. We call this the saltatory conduction, the jumping action. Speed of conduction is proportional to the diameter of the nerve. The speed of conduction is related to the internodal distance. What does that mean? The distance between two nodes of Ranvier. So you're trying to say that as the distance between two adjacent nodes increase, the greater the speed of production. Yes, doofus, this is exactly what I'm saying. Oh, and by the way, let's say that you are a bigger fiber, like fiber A. As the fiber's diameter gets bigger, also the internodal distance tend to get bigger and longer. So it's like two birds with one stone. In the first part, 
I am the bigger diameter. If you have a bigger diameter, you have a greater speed of conduction. Second, since I have a bigger diameter, I have a bigger internodal distance, and this will also increase my speed of propagation. That's why type A fibers are the best. So why not make all of my fibers from A type? Because myelin is stinking expensive, and there are no solutions in life, there are only trade offs. If you want all of your fibers to be A, you will be as obese as a sumo wrestler, you will eat 8 meals a day, and you will spend the rest of the day in the bathroom. If you like this video, you will adore my CNS Pharmacology course on my website medicosisperfectionalis.com. It comes with 20 videos, notes, and cases. And now you can get a 40% discount towards anything on my website. Just use promo code histamine for the next 27 students only. I have a CNS pharmacology course, antibiotics course, cardiac pharmacology course, autocoids pharmacology course, acid base imbalance course, anti cancer pharmacology course, autonomic pharmacology course, and others. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Go to Picmonic for animated medical mnemonics. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.